Good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Susan Womack. I work here at Millsaps in the um, Institutional Advancement Office. And it's my pleasure, on behalf of Millsaps and our Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Campus Center, um, to welcome all of you tonight for this discussion on health care inequities. Um, I want to express appreciation to the Mississippi Humanities Council and Mississippi Today for their co-sponsorship of this event um, and tell you a little bit about the work of, of our Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Campus Center, otherwise known as TRHT. One of the things we work on on our campus and in our community is identifying systems that create a, hi a hierarchy of human value where some people clearly are valued more than others uh, just by the fact that they are better served by these systems than others. Um, and we want to build a future where we truly celebrate our equal and connected humanity. And in order to do that, we have to first identify these systems. As we continue to work through the COVID-19 pandemic, um, inequities in healthcare throughout our country, and in, indeed the world, and in fact, Mississippi, um, have become more and more pronounced. And we're fortunate to have an expert panel tonight to inform us and enlighten us on the challenges we face, because we know it is challenging, and how we might improve our current systems. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce them now, but before I do, I have to also note that the views expressed by our panelists are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of their employers, um, specifically the state of Mississippi or the University of Mississippi Medical Center. So first, um, on this end, uh, Dr. Alan Penman is a physician and professor in the Department of Preventive Medicine at the John D. Bauer School of Population Health at the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson, Mississippi, where he directs and teaches courses in epidemiology, biostatistics, public and community health, and global health for medical students and graduate medical faculty. Dr. Penman directs the UMMC Community Health Advocate Program, which trains lay people and health professions, students to be community health advocates and screeners, with a focus on the medically underserved low-income and minority communities. He also oversees the social health clinic at the Jackson Free Clinic, which is a student-run nonprofit organization offering free medical, dental, and specialty services to uninsured patients. A native of Scotland, Dr. Penman earned his medical degree from the Aberdeen University Medical Center in 1979. He later earned a Master of Science degree in clinical tropical medicine from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, a Master of Public Health degree from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and a PhD in biostatistics from the University of Mississippi. Lejeune Johnson is the founder and CEO of Therapy Plus. Since, not, since 2014, Therapy Plus has provided therapy-based services to the children and families of Mississippi. Trained as a licensed clinical social worker, she earned a bachelor's degree in social work from the Mississippi State University and later received a master's degree in social work from Jackson State University. Mrs. Johnson's passion for working with trauma survivors led her to obtain a trauma-informed care postdoctorate, postgraduate certification from Mississippi College. And currently, she is nearing completion of perinatal mental health certification from Postpartum Support International. Her professional background includes work with the Centers for Disease Control, the Mississippi State Department of Health, and the Mississippi Department of Child Protective Services. Next, we have Lamise El Sadek. She's a Jackson-based epidemiologist focusing on the social and economic determinants that contribute to health inequities. She graduated from Millsaps College and the John Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. She's a Gates Millennium Scholar and Doctor of Public Health candidate at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She's also currently the project director of the NIH-funded Community Engagement Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities at the Mississippi State Department of Health. Dr. Nelson Atehortua de la Pena, known among his colleagues and the community as Dr. A, is the Director of Evaluation of the Office of Preventative 
Preventative Health and Health Equity for the Mississippi State Department of Health. Dr. A is a medical doctor. He completed his medical school and postgraduate training in health services management in Columbia, South America. He came to the U.S. to earn a Master of Public Health degree from Western Kentucky University and a Ph.D. from Texas A&M University. In addition, he has rounded his scientific training with postdoctoral fellowships in public health genomics through the University of the Sciences in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in leadership education in neurodevelopmental and other disabilities through the joint LEND program between Utah State University and the University of Utah, in biomedical research excellence through the Mississippi Center for Clinical and Translational Research. That's a collaborative effort between the Uni University of Mississippi Medical Center and the University of Southern Mississippi, and more recently as a fellow with the National Medical Fellowships on Diversity in Clinical Trials Research. And our narrator tonight, I mean our moderator, excuse me, is Kate Royals. She's a Jackson native and 2010 Millsaps graduate. She served as lead education reporter at Mississippi Today from 2016 to 2018, and again from 2020 to 2021. Prior to that, she was a reporter for the Clarion Ledger, covering education and state government. Kate became Mississippi Today's first community health editor in January 2022. As you can see, we have an expert panel here tonight. And it's my pleasure now to turn this program over to them um, and say thank you for being here. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm, um, I feel honored to be able to have this conversation with you all. So um, I'll just kick us off uh, by asking Dr. A, uh, in responding to our invitation to participate in the panel, you described the inequities in our healthcare system as the elephant in the room. And this is a question for all of our panelists. Um, I want to try and just get some context. Can we talk about how the elephant got into the room in the first place? In other words, what do you want our audience to know about the history of inequality and access to physical and mental health treatment and in standards of care in Jackson and in Mississippi? What are the roots of these disparities? Well, thank you. And uh, first of all, thank you to uh, the institution for having organizing this uh, panel. I think it's a very important uh, conversation to have. And also, um, I do appreciate uh, having me here with you all today. Um, I will say, I will start like, okay, uh, when I got the invitation, I said, well, this sounds like a little paradoxical, right? It's a paradox uh, that we're in a state where, you know, all the branches of government are held by minority uh, by the GOP, and then there is this expression, as you mentioned, Kay, that is the elephant in the room. So uh, that was kind of, you know, I said, well, it's interesting that we're talking about elephants here. Uh, <laughs> right? So, um, but my, my point is, I mean, this is, uh, you know, related to the original definition that the French call it the laissez-passer, the laissez right? Laissez-faire, laissez-passer. That was the initial conception of free market economy, right? So we have a way to understand free market economy. There are some con uh, um, conceptions uh, that are defining what a market imperfect competition entail, right? And so we have, right, homogeneous uh, products, right? Uh, producers and consumers are free to come in and out, right? There are no uh, price fixing. Uh, and, and there is supposed to be equal information, both sides. So everybody know what you're talking about. Um, I will say probably more like going to buy a car. You have about the same information, never have the same information as the dealership. But you have a good kind of information about what you are going to get into. But with health, it's completely different. There's a huge asymmetry, and that works for all the other conditions for a perfect uh, for a market in perfect competition. So it's highly imperfect. 
So when this happens, the economical theory says, okay, you have to introduce certain mechanisms that will help you balance that out, right? And, and one of those actors for uh, compensating for that lack of uh, perfection in the market is government. So um, basically, uh, just like what happened recently here in the state of Mississippi in that dispute in between Blue Cross Blue Shield and UMC, you remember that, that there were people that couldn't have services because they were the, the insurance company and the provider will not in agreement with the contract. I mean, that was finally solved, but that's exactly the way it should work is government went in and fixed the problem so the people could have the services. So that's, that's essential because 50 years ago, I mean, like, uh, we're about to, it's 49 years and, and two months, to be more accurate, and who's counting, right? Um, there was a president in the United States called Richard Nixon, and he came to Congress asking for a comprehensive health insurance plan and say, well, we need it because basically we have millions of Americans that don't have uh, health insurance coverage, and for those who have health insurance, some of them don't have enough coverage. So there was a, a problem there. And also, uh, you know, there was this um, need for improving a lot of different components of health care, especially infrastructure, and making uh, the access to, to the services easier for the people. And, and we're talking about 50 years ago. So we're talking about this from long time ago. And uh, quite frankly, you know, if I repeat this and I don't mention uh, Richard Nixon, the people will say, oh, he's talking about the current situation. So if we are talking about 50 years ago and now, we are about in the same place. So now my question will be, and in terms of a research question, okay, where all that reasoning that was argued at that time 50 years ago to have the chip, because that was how the, the program ended up being called, the Comprehensive Health Insurance Program chip, right? We still have some chip there, but it's not what it was initially proposed, right? So uh, where all that reasoning go? That, that will be, for, for this particular question, that will be my counter research question. And if I could just, you know, um, add on to what uh, Dr. A was saying, I hope that, you know, one of the main takeaways that we can all walk away with or what uh, we can convey or highlight is how health inequities are deeply rooted in the social determinants of health. And the social determinants of health are things and conditions that we don't control when we are born into this world, right? Our socioeconomic status, when we come into this world, we don't control that. Uh, the neighborhood that we grow up in, uh, the education that we receive, uh, the type of uh, resources, um, social supports that we receive, access to power, access to um, other resources. All of these things deeply impact our quality of life. All of these things dip deeply, um, directly impact our life expectancy. But we have no control over these things. And so I think that by engaging in this conversation today about the social determinants of health and confronting that is one of the first steps all of us can take um, in addressing health inequity. Yeah, can I jump in there? Mm -hmm. So the title of this panel is Racial Disparities in Health and Healthcare. And I'm so glad you started talking about the healthcare system or non-system, right? Mm -hmm. we, have, and we don't have a system. Because I was hoping we could get the conversation expanded to that because mm -hmm. racial and ethnic disparities in health and healthcare are actually just the kind of raw wound on, on the surface of a much, much bigger problem, mm -hmm. which is our healthcare profit-driven non-system. So I hope we spend quite a bit of time talking about that, because that is the root problem here, as far as I'm concerned. You ask how far back this goes, the disparity side? Well, how about 500 years, okay? Because there's a well-documented literature now on systemic dis racial disparities in this country in health, in health care, and in medical education, okay? 
about the lack of medical schools, or I should say the lack of training for African-American physicians and other healthcare professionals. And that's been a systemic racist problem. And you can find that as far back as you want to go, starting with uh, hospitals or clinics or lack of such on plantations, okay? And you can fast forward to uh, 19, about 1905 when the Flexner report came out, and that's the report that turned, that basically changed medical education and made it kind of what it still is today, science-based, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that resulted in the closure of five of, five of the existing African American medical schools, and left them left the, the country with two: Howard and I'm blanking on the other one. And that was only two for the whole country. Mm. And so for 500 years we've been playing catch-up, and that's how deep the roots of this problem are. But as I say, that's the disparity side of thing. But that is the sort of ugly surface piece of a much deeper problem, mm. which is a market-driven, profit-driven health system. And uh, I actually just came from talking to a group of medical students uh, an hour ago on healthcare systems. So this is, I mean, this is timely. It's going to get worse before it gets better. This will be an election issue in 2024, uh, for sure. So, uh, you know, we're, appro we're approaching a point where surely we, we've got to fix this problem. You know, it failed in 94. There were good reasons for that. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, I won't call it Obamacare, I think that's derogatory. Uh, the Affordable Care Act was basically a band-aid on a broken system, and it really didn't change the, 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 the private market profit-driven system that we have. So we need uh, major, major changes, which will include uh, dealing with racial and ethnic disparities. Uh, and, and, and socioeconomic disparities generally. And to elaborate on this point of things getting worse before they, they get better, just a couple of months ago, CDC released life expectancy data mm -hmm. that showed now Americans are living on average to 76 years, which is a drop. Uh, before the pandemic, we were almost at 79 years. The last time we were at 76 years was in 1996. In Mississippi, it's even worse. Uh, our average life expectancy is around 72 years, and for black Mississippians, it's somewhere around 69 or 70. Uh, so this issue of inequities in our health outcomes, and even um, whether it's by quality or quantity, is not a unique Mississippi problem. It's an American problem. Mississippi has worse outcomes than America, maybe because the epicenter of a lot of our discriminatory and segregation, um, segre segregatory, can I say that? Mm. Um, history and policies were rooted in the Deep South. Um, and so we're seeing the outcomes of this today, but it's important, let's also take a back step. Um, Governor William Winter uh, has a, famous quote that says, you can't put a f your foot on someone's neck to keep them in the trenches without staying down there with them. So there was a report that um, came out about 10 or 11 years. It was, by the NI it was con um, convened by the NIH, and it was to look at what, how the USA healthcare system is performing in comparison to other nations, mm -hmm. particularly among other high-income countries. And it showed that we're doing really, really bad. Even the wealthiest among us are doing really bad. And there is a study where they looked at the top 16 wealthiest countries, US, of course, topping that list, and white Americans were dying earlier than any, um, than any of the populations in that study. So this goes back to the idea that yes, our minority, our racial and minority communities do face poorer outcomes than our white communities and our wealthier communities, but even those communities aren't doing well on a global level. 
And so um, we'll get we we'll probably get into some of the, um, some more of the social and, and political uh, structures that have been put in place to create this system or lack of healthcare system. But I think it's an important point to remember that by trying, attempting to give certain populations uh, more privileged than other populations, we actually end up hurting all of us. Um, and whenever um, the CDC report came out that uh, showed you know, we've lost years, oh, and another point, mm -hmm. sir, there's so much to say around this. Um, is we lost two years of life expectancy um, during the pandemic. But most high-income countries actually rebounded within this past year. So on average, high-income countries lost about 0.2 years of life expectancy, and then they've gained that within the past year. The U.S. has lost two years of life expectancy, and we're not showing any signs of rebounding. Um, and then. One of the authors that um, was writing about this loss of life expectancy was making fun of the New Hampshire state motto, which is uh, live free or die. And their conclusion about this life uh, loss of um, priority and value to implementing social systems and policies in place um, that don't necessarily focus on the biomedical understanding of health outcomes, but the social determinants of health and the public health uh, understanding of outcomes. The fact that we keep buying into this um, unfair biomedical system of treating patients ends up with a live free and die. It's no longer live free or die, where you just live free and die. Can I just piggyback off of that? Uh, so the popular phrase, we all use it, the SDH, the social determinants of health. We need to stop using that. It's the societal determinants of health. Mm -hmm. This is Barbara Starfield's phrase. She was a famous pediatrician, now past, big advocate for maternal and child health. And she said, uh, this is not just a semantic thing. Societal determinants of health means you're thinking about the whole society. And in this case, it's coming down to socioeconomics and racism, mm -hmm. systemic racism. The, the you structure talk about of the society. The whole structure of the whole society mm -hmm. that gets to your, you know, being, your, being down in the, in the ditch as well. It's all of us. It hurts yes. all of us. And, and one of, it costs one, all of us. Yeah, and one salient thing there is that, yes, a lot of people have been working and working very hard to try to narrow the gap that we have. Unfortunately, we collectively, as a society, we have failed. Yeah, and the reason is, if we talk about just social determinants of health, this is how we do research on this. We find out what the uh, health outcomes are in white people and black people mm -hmm. and Hispanic people and whatever. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of saying like, uh, well, let's, that, that says, the result of that is, well, you say, well, let's put more funding into programs for the worst group which is usually African-Americans. And, and it doesn't address the big societal problems. So we need to move away from just labeling it as social determinants of health. Correct. Okay? Yeah. And maybe just, sorry, Dr. A, maybe just one point is this isn't really opinion. This is fact. Uh, there, is a, there is a big study, a landmark study that was issued by the British Medical Journal, BMJ, um, a while ago that estimated only up to 10 to 20 percent of our differences in health outcomes are related to our genetics, genetic code. Mm -hmm. So just a minority of our health differences are accounted by the way we were born, mm -hmm. bad luck or good luck. The overwhelming majority of how we fare in life by quality in life and how long we live is related to our zip code, and, and by zip code, I mean it very broadly as a, as a metaphor for the societal determinants of health. Right. And, and as this situation in Mississippi has not improved, I mean, we check the data, we see that. Uh, you take the last 50 years of data and you see that the trend is the same, it's a flat line. So we are not really closing that. So in, in the, uh, the next impact of that is that in Mississippi, we're actually doing it worse. I mean, right now, check the statistics for Mississippi, and you have, I don't know, 95% of all the indicators in public health. Mississippi is scoring 50 
or 51, depending whether you have the District of Columbia involved in the, in the ranking or not. Yeah, and the Commonwealth Fund just brought out a report, you know, mm -hmm. I think this is the latest, that Mississippi once again ranks the worst overall for healthcare access, quality, and Correct. affordability. Yeah. For any dimension that you want to make the analysis, unfortunately, Mississippi is ranking last. That's, that's sad. And, and, and again, I, I think that a lot of people, I'm surprised by the amount of people that work incredibly hard to try to change or curb that trend. But unfortunately, as a society, uh, there's not enough critical mass to make the, the adjustment that we need. So this kind of reminds me of a quote I've heard before where it's, um, you can, if there are people falling in a river, you can pull them out at the bottom of the river as much as you can, but eventually you have to look upstream and see who's pushing them in the river. So is this, what, what not who, but what is pushing <clears throat> the people in the river in terms of these horrible healthcare outcomes in, your, in each of your areas that you work in? Well, I would say, uh, you mentioned it's, it's very little of it is genetics, or biological, agreed. Uh, it's also not behaviors, largely. Mm -hmm. People don't, poor people don't wake up on New Year's Day and say, well, I think I'll put on 30 or 40 pounds this year. Maybe I'll get diabetes if I'm lucky. Oh, that's an anti-New Year's resolution. That is exactly. You know, it's because with lack of money and jobs and benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably live in a food desert. You all know what they are. Correct. Uh, you could talk about exercise deserts. And now we've got healthcare deserts because we've got actual or pending closure of rural, rural hospitals in the state due to basically lack of the Medicaid expansion. Yeah. So you've got a healthcare a desert as well. Yeah. I mean, how many barriers do you want to put up in front of people? the best will in the world, how are you going to be healthy? You know, for a lot of us here, you know, uh, we have certain choices about where to shop and get decent food and, and join a gym. Mm -hmm. uh, but even then, it's still, uh, uh, that's just a, f a part of what determines people's health and population's health. It comes down to the systems and the policies and the laws and the programs that are in place at all the different levels, local, state, mm -hmm. and federal. And, and we can maybe talk about that. Yeah. And, and uh, in that part, I, I mean, when I am interacting with the students, I have a way to present them with this. And I say, well, usually people think, I mean, that's, that's the first uh, idea that comes. Because it has been discussed for centuries that, oh, this is due to the genetics, and we know about those uh, superior uh, races, ideas, and, and, and we know that it's not true, but still there's some people that actually believe in that, right? And so I tell the students, uh, well, you know, usually people think that, but in reality is the environment has an influence, but fundamentally everything comes down to the choices quote unquote choices, because sometimes you don't have a choice, is what you can do to solve your need at that particular moment. If you go to the Delta, right, and it will be extremely hard to find a grocery store in the, in the proper sense of the word. There's not, I mean, there are towns that don't have, the only thing that they have is the Dollar General and whatever is by, in, in sale there. And not necessarily will be the best uh, option of fresh fruits and vegetables, one, and two, whether the people living in that town will be able to purchase them or not. So when we use, and then I tell them, when we're talking about behaviors, sometimes you need to refine that idea about, okay, what kind of choices are they making? Because sometimes there's no choice. In reality, they're doing what they can in order to survive. So that will come, you will know, I mean, we're in that sense, privilege, you know, to have the opportunity to make a choice in between a burger and something that will not be the same, or at least a burger that is healthy, right? If, if you take a look at the burger, you see it's a great idea from a nutritional standpoint because it will have some carbs, 
it will have vegetables, it will have the protein there, right? So in theory, the burger will be a great thing, but the way we know it is not that healthy, right? So, but at least we can make the choice because we have a way to purchase the alternative that usually is more expensive. But a lot of people cannot make that choice. And then we have the consequences down the road of that. And a baby can't make that choice. Huh? If you're born into a poor family, I mean, you're on a trajectory. Yeah. That it's very difficult to get out of, increasingly yeah. so. It's, it's... We talk about this myth, the American myth, the myth of social mobility or economic mobility. That may happen to like two people, mm -hmm. you know, but for most people, it is difficult to get off of that trajectory. Uh, and increasingly so, they're showing studies showing that economic or social mobility is actually decreasing and has been decreasing for decades. And, and, and yet we perpetuate this myth. If you work hard, you know, be good, work hard, earn money, hey, you'll be fine. You can do anything you want. A complete myth. And, and when we're talking about healthcare, it's even worse because sometimes, I mean, if, if you're an immigrant, right? And, and then barely you can have access to a health insurance. Let's say that you have, you're an immigrant and you're lucky to have access to a sort of insurance because the majority of the immigrants, you know, they pay cash and they, they pay full price, whatever they charge in the clinic when they go to look for a service. Uh, they might be reluctant to go there because of the fear of uh, uh, provi having to provide information that will conduce to, you know, a rate, something like that, that will provide information to sensitive information, or that they will be perceiving that they're discriminated against in the way they're treated or in the way that they are told how to do certain things or the kind of prescriptions that they will get. Their, their voice is not heard. And, and sometimes the way, not, not even heard or not heard in the way that they would like or prefer to. So that's another component is also, you know, this kind of disconnection in between the institutions in health, in the healthcare and, and the healthcare providers that are not creating that channel, that empathy with the, 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 the patients that come, especially when they're in this kind of difficult situation. They don't have the insurance, they will pay cash, they will pay a lot, and still they feel like they're treating like they're nobodies. It's not a very sexy answer, but it's true. Poverty and lack of education mm -hmm. account for so much of our behaviors and outcomes and how our expectations, how we're treated by the medical system, how we mm -hmm. interact with the medical system. One in five Mississippians is under the poverty line. Mm -hmm. It's the highest poverty level in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, we like to put political labels on it or political blame and say, you know, if this party passes this policy, if this party just does this. But if you look at Madison and Rankin County, which are two uh, c politically conservative counties, they have some of the best health outcomes in the state. When you look at their COVID vaccination uptake, they had some of the highest COVID vaccination rates in the state. So, when you're well educated and when you have the resources to mm -hmm. make good decisions and to access the resources that you need, you're a more informed and healthier citizen and you're mm -hmm. better equipped to advocate for so for your fellow citizens. And so I think that's one area that we can focus on and one area that can unite us um, because it's really, uh, political divides tear us apart, they prevent us from making progress. And Mississippi has a lot of progress to be made. So if we can somehow focus on the policies that impact poverty and education, no matter how unsexy it is, I think a lot of other things will fall into place. And I agree with what Lamise was saying. Um, yes, Madison County, Rankin County, typically have better healthcare outcomes. They also have higher um, a higher white demographic um, in those counties as well. And when we look at counties with more 
densely African American populated counties, we see the reverse effect, right? Mm -hmm. We see higher um, health outcomes that are on the out the adverse side of things. Um, I really appreciate that we've been having a, a conversation about how poverty is impacting um, our lives, and not just from a national perspective, but also here regionally in Mississippi. Lamise was saying that you know we are the poorest state in the United States. And being the poorest state in the United States comes with consequences. And those consequences typically mean that we are at the bottom of most lists or at the top of lists that we don't want to be on, like the highest infant mortality rate in the United States, mm -hmm. like the highest maternal mortality rates in the United States. Well, we are amongst the highest maternal mortality rates. Not the highest, but I mean, we're getting up there. But close. Yes. We're getting up there, especially with the recent numbers that um, have um, come out. And again, I don't think that this is a, a coincidence. Um, you know, African Americans or black and brown people are at particular risk for poverty, at particular risk for encountering mortality, uh, chronic disease. Um, and these are things that we really have to take a look at and start asking ourselves, you know, really hard hitting question as to why that is. Yeah, and not, not to say that we just had a big pandemic, right? COVID-19, I mean, we didn't have a big pandemic in a century. We had other pandemics. I mean, a lot of people thought that this coronavirus was the first coronavirus. No, it's not. I mean, we've had two pandemics before caused by coronaviruses, but the people weren't paying attention. It wasn't that social media availability that may put us in contact, right? The first one was SARS, right, in the uh, 2000s right, early 2000s. And then we have something called the MERS, that was the Middle Eastern uh, uh, respiratory. Respiratory. respiratory syndrome, right, the MERS. MERS actually was more lethal than COVID-19, but it wasn't that, that transmissible. And it was practically, you know, reduced to a group of countries there in the Mediterranean and in the, in the uh, close Eastern part of the world. So that's why the Middle Eastern uh, name. So those two pandemics happened before nobody was paying attention, but this one was the big one. And look, in America, more than a million people passed away just because of the pandemic, excess deaths. See, in, in the real life happened, but in, in the theoretical world, they shouldn't have happened if we had been prepared, if we didn't have all these conditions. So, and everything that we had bad was aggravated by the occurrence of the pandemic. Now we finally start seeing the consequences of that. Uh, the people were like, I don't know, uh, blocked or uh, uh, numb because of everything came up so fast and then you have to stay home and telework, right? So stay there, we don't know how long. I mean, we were two years in that situation. And then, but life was happening in those two years and the people didn't notice. And now that we are out back again to normal or whatever we call normal now, uh, that's what we see, the huge disconnect. Now we see the hospitals are about to die. And, and I mean, this is kind of a, you know, in quotes, expression, the hospitals are about to die because the crisis in the health care uh, system is so huge that, hey, what, how did this happen? Well, that's the situation that we're talking about. And, and I like when uh, Lamise was mentioning, it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat, you're a Republican. I mean, if we're talking about this historic context, and just mentioning the last 50 years, because I, I just wanted to make sure, you know, that context will be provided, how many Republican presidents we've had in 50 years? How many Democrat presidents we've had in 50 years? But in these 50 years, the description I was making is like the description of today. So really nothing much has changed. So it's, it's more, I, I'll say it's more a societal type of problem than a political problem. Because if we make this uh, agreement as a society that we want to fix this, Politics will not matter, right? But we're not there yet. 
I'll only add one caveat to this. I think it's both. I think it's political and societal. A lot of policies are put in place or not in, put in place that enable or don't enable accessibility to healthcare resources. But a lot of this is facts, a lot of this is research, a lot of this is known, but when we have a more educated citizenry, when people vote for their interest, for the public's interest, then politics have to follow what the people want. But when the people don't demand what's good for our society, then what's the incentive? What's the incentive for people in the legislature or in positions of power to change the status quo? But, but yeah. that depends on whether the driver is ideology or not, right? I mean, we have the policies, right? This, this is how we organize the things to work and work properly. That is different to the ideological positions, and that's where the disconnection happens, because people then start going to the edges, to the streams, and have all, we cannot do this because of, and that's, you know, Richard Nixon is a Republican. He's supposed to be on that uh, side of uh, the ideological spectrum, and still he was advocating for having a health insurance program. So that, that's what is the paradox here, because it, it, everything changes depending on the cycle, the election cycle, and, and not necessarily is good for, yeah, for, but for the progress. I'm of very pessimistic about the political road, given the polarized situation yes, in uh, Congress. Exactly. I just don't see. So what does it mean? It means it's going to have to be a civil movement, a, a social movement, a widespread national civil rights movement, a repeat of the 1960s, civil rights for health. Yeah, I mean, you tell me, but that seems to me is probably the only way of making real progress here. Uh, and I don't see, I think it'll be an issue again in 2024, but I think it's going to be business as usual. Such is the lobbying power of the pharmaceutical industry, the hospital industry, the medical equipment industry, mm. the insurance industry. I mean, we're talking about David and Goliath stuff here. Mm -hmm. So you tell me how that's going to change. I think it's going to have to be a grassroots, from the grassroots up kind of movement. We're all going to have to sign petitions, make it a charter for equal justice and health. And we're all going to have to go and march on Washington. I don't know. But seriously. And there, are, there is a body of legal scholarship at the moment mm. talking about this, a small group. You don't see it much in the public health journals, I don't think, yet, or the medical journals. But the civil, right, civil rights for health is a kind well, of... Well, and in the United States, there are other countries in which health is a right in, their, in the constitutions. Yeah. So, so that's different in the United States. It's not. All right. In, this, in all the wealthy countries, we are the only one that doesn't have universal health care. We're the only one. I mean, it stands out in a map like a mm -hmm. sore eye. And there are different ways to get to universal health care, but universal health care basically means a basic package of health care for everybody, for everybody at no charge. No one should ever have to be out of pocket for this, okay? Now, there are different ways to get there, and we can talk about that now or later, I don't know. It doesn't have to be a so single payer type of system. We have great models everywhere. We have one next door to the north, the Canadian system. Germany has a good system. Switzerland has a good system. Taiwan has a great system. They actually traveled around and looked at different countries when they, they redid their system in the 90s. And they said, they looked at the US healthcare system, they said, uh-uh, we're not gonna touch this. It's, it's not even a system. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty of, this is not, it doesn't have to be an experiment. We're not jumping off a cliff here. We can look at what other countries have done and done successfully and maybe not so good. And we can take those pieces. And the great thing about this is if we treat it as a societal thing, we're, we're kind of fixing health disparities at the same time, right? Whether it's by race or money or whatever, that's part of the package. If healthcare is available, free of charge to everyone. Well, if it is indeed going to be or a civil movement, I mean, I feel like Mississippi would be one of the places for that, just like ground zero for that to start as we have, you know, one of the highest rates of uninsured people in the country. 
and yet we're one of 10 states not to expand Medicaid. Um, North Carolina, which also has a Republican-controlled legislature, I think last week uh, just expanded Medicaid, and studies here in Mississippi have shown that it would uh, give health healthcare coverage to some 200 to 300,000 additional people, um, most of them the working poor. Um, so I guess I just, what do you want your our audience to know about how the decision not to expand Medicaid will impact Mississippians, or is already very much <laughs> impacting Mississippians? I mean, from- That's an from, easy question. Yeah, I mean, but from a, if you want to give a short answer to that, I mean, if, if we're talking about uh, American terminology, uh, I'd say it's no, not a good deal not to expand it. I mean, the numbers are there. Like, okay, what's the deal? You expand this, I'll give you 90% of the expenses, you put 10% of the expenses. So for every dollar that you put in this, you'll get nine. So when we're running the numbers, and this, this was a good question, if you run for 200,000 people, right, the state will have to spend about $130 million a year, right, for 200,000. For 300,000, it will be about $200, $200 million a year, right? And we were just recently seeing that the legislature was approving $104 million to save the hospitals, right? Uh, so if you think in terms of a business, not taking $9 for each dollar that I have here in the pocket, I mean, I think it's not a, it's not a very logical idea. I will take it. On the other side, the hospitals will have much better probabilities to recover their costs having those additional $9 in the system that not having them, right? And again, I understand for ideological reasons, right? Somebody is not in agreement with that expansion, but that is one way of looking at the problem while the evidence, right, is showing us that the business goes in a different direction. So to me is, I will say, if, if I was the decision maker, I would think in pragma pure pragmatical terms. I would say I'll take it because it's a good deal for me in, in the state. Yeah, I think, uh, I think if from the tone, it feels like all the panelists agree that Medicaid expansion would be something that would be very favorable and advantageous for mm -hmm. our state um, in Mississippi, not just for the state itself, but for its citizens as well. You know, increased jobs, increased revenue to try to help make our state more desirable for businesses mm -hmm. to come, um, to increase tourism. We're mi missing out on all of those things. Like Dr. A was saying, we could recoup some of that money that these rural hospitals and clinics are missing out on getting re-encompensated re for. Mm -hmm. um, we've all seen on the news, a lot of our rural hospitals and clinics are closing, mm -hmm. or at, in, like very much so danger of closing. Um, and so Medicaid expansion is something that could resolve that. If we look at our neighbors in Louisiana, they adopted Medicaid expansion in 2016, and it has uh, served them handsomely. Um, I think I have a statistic here that they decreased their uncompensated care costs by 55% mm -hmm. and also saw a reduction in more and mortality rates across the board. We need that <laughs> here in Mississippi. Um, and so when we think about what is at stake, what do we have to lose when we don't adopt Medicaid expansion? Well, there's a lot to lose for the citizens and for the state as a, as a whole. I mean, every 35 states, is it 35, 34, 35, did expand Medicaid starting in 2014? So far, 45. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah, 35, 40, 40, haven't. 40, we're 10 states Yeah. without as So all the 30 plus states who started doing this back in 2014, they've all shown positive impacts. Mm -hmm. Better health, people are happier, and the, the economies generally expanded. There were more jobs and more people feeling better could go back to work. I mean, it was a no brainer. They've all benefited. And we've sat here for eight years and refused to take this. And under the American Rescue Plan, Biden's plan, they offered an additional 5% to mm -hmm. 
to be paid by the federal government. I mean, if you run the numbers, and people have run the numbers, uh, we would all, Mississippi would have to pay, what is it, 10%? Yeah, 10%. 10% of the cost. R rough number. Federal government pays 90. But the savings, health and economic savings, offset that. And we would actually end up with a surplus of 200 billion with a B dollars. Mm -hmm. 200 million. 200 million dollars. Mm -hmm. That's free money. The state could put that in a separate rainy day fund. And the big complaint, the so-called justification for not expanding Medicaid, has been that, well, sooner or later, the state's going to have to pick up the tab, more and more of the tab, right. OK? Well, we'll have a rainy day fund of free federal money to start offsetting that time. And, and one I mean, argument of the counterpart is that, OK, but this is now, but then in the, in the future, the, the, the federal government is going to have a fiscal problem, and then they will reduce the amount of dollars that are available to you, and then you will have to put yeah. more money. That's one argument, right? Yeah. But then there's, there's the circular argument again. If we start expanding and we start saving money, and we start improving the, 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 the health outcomes of the population, the costs of providing health care are going to be less. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of that exercise that we have when we're talking about tobacco, right? And say, well, the, the single most effective way to reduce tobacco consumption is to raise taxes, right? We have been trying to have the legislature to increase the current excise tax on tobacco products from 68 cents to $1.5, right? Right now, Mississippi has 68 cents as the excise tax. Uh, tax for tobacco products. Unfortunately, we've tried, we've tried, but no uh, unsuccessful efforts. Uh, 1.5, right, dollar and a half. And, and we've run the numbers for this, the impact of the taxation, the additional taxation. And the savings way compensate for uh, not just the additional revenue for the state, because that's the least important part of it, is the, the effective way that you have people out of smoking and less cancers and less many other diseases that are associated with the smoking. So, so that is the catch there. So when we spend the Medicaid, yes, we start making this virtuous cycle of improving the conditions, therefore we're spending less in healthcare I mean, it will be the reasonable amount for some time because we're talking about a million people here, right? Two million people here. So that's not going to happen night to day, but at least we'll have a very good impact at the moment of the implementation of the expansion. Okay. Um, I think it's time for audience members to ask some questions, if y'all would like. I think we have about 10 minutes for that. Uh, Michael is going to walk around with the microphone. Thank you. Um, so I know a lot of us are pre-med students in the room that are really hoping to go into medicine and be the ge next generation of physicians. And so for you all, I have a question like, what would be your advice to us to kind of remedy this issue in the ways that we can? And what mindset do we need to have going into medicine to resolve some of these issues? Please go into public health, please, <laughs> or population health, or health policy, something like that. Yeah? Definitely. You know, because I'm not going to blame any individual physician. Physicians are busy. They're basically mm -hmm. putting out fires every day. Yeah. And that's kind of what it is. And as a physician, you know, once you graduate, you get sucked into the system you're working in the system that really needs to be changed, but you don't have time to fix the system that you're mm -hmm. in, right? Uh, you're busy paying off your debt, you're married with kids and a mortgage, blah, blah, blah. And it takes, you know, until you're maybe older, you can step back and say, well, actually, this system stinks, mm -hmm. you know? So we need more. I'm sorry, I don't care if you want to be a cardiologist or... <laughs> Uh, we need cardiologists, but maybe not so many. Uh, we need great people in health policy and public health, population health, which is political. 
And that, that's what it is. Yeah. Thanks. And to me, it will be whatever uh, specialty you prefer. Look at your patient as the human being that that person is. Look at the person. And think of their trajectory, how they got to where they are. You know, their whole life course, you know. Look at the person. Yeah. That will be my best advice. If, if you do that, it doesn't matter your specialty. You do great. I mean, I tell all the students, the medical students, you know, uh, who makes health and healthcare policy decisions? It's legislators at the state or federal level. They're mostly almost never physicians. Mm -hmm. They're really not. They're lawyers, basically, particularly at the congressional level. And they, if they don't hear from physicians and physicians' organizations, guess what? They assume everything's okay. Everything's ticking along fine. And, and then if anything, changes, if anything needs to be changed, they'll make it. So we need even stronger health, healthcare professionals' voices getting their hands dirty in, in policy making, in po medical politics, which is what pu public health is. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep pounding on this point of implicit bias and to really question your perceptions of your patients and what assumptions you're making about your patients. I mean, even as someone, you know, who's as privileged as I am, I'm f finishing my doctorate degree, I have had so many encounters with providers where mm. they didn't listen to me as, as a patient. Yes. They just, you know, I had a physician who told me, you know how many years of training I've had? Do you know what I had to do to get this job? You think you know more than me? No, I don't think I know more than you, but I know myself very well. <laughs> and so, you know, sometimes we can't change the system, but you can change how you interact with an individual, with a patient. And that's very powerful. That's even more powerful than changing the system because you have a direct impact on the patient, not an indirect impact. My brother's an M4, I'm a fourth year medical student. He just matched into internal uh, medicine residency. But I cannot, the patient has a good understanding of their treatment, their protocol has had all of their questions answered and has all their resources, holistic resources they need to take care of their health. So Dr. Hennigan is an example of how to be a good doctor, and I will not give you all the bad examples. <laughs> we got three questions right here in the middle. Um. Because of sake of time, I'm gonna make sure my question is very direct, quick, and impactful. So the question is, and I wrote it down, what, is the, what role does social welfare policy have on the health disparities for Mississippians? That's the first part of it. And how do we collaborate the interests of community stakeholders to focus on having, grassroot, having a grassroots approach similar to the approach that we did with Fannie Lou Hamer, Democratic, Mississippi Democratic Party back in 1964? Two part question. My brain is not, so I'm gonna take the first part. The first part is what can social workers do to to social welfare policy. What role? Okay, so um, in my work, um, I have been working directly with the Mississippi State Department of Health. I've been working directly with the CDC, particularly with the maternal and infant health uh, programs. As you know, in the state of Mississippi, unfortunately, we are number one in infant death. Um, we, are, we have very high maternal mortality rates meaning that women who are pregnant in the state of Mississippi or in the postpartum period are very uh, at risk for complications and death. Um, and so my role in what I do centers a lot around advocacy work, uh, raising awareness, uh, collaborating with uh, stakeholders to community stakeholders to bring about uh, strategies for solutions. So I would say advocacy work, the power of advocacy work is 
is very, very strong for social work. Um, I would also say you brought up Fannie Lou Hamer, who was an am amazing uh, civil rights activist, um, coined the term Mississippi appendectomy. She actually uh, suffered, uh, she was a victim of a Mississippi appendectomy, had her wound taken from her without her consent uh, after and doctors at that time practiced, pra, you know, routinely practiced that where they would remove the womb of black women that they felt were unsuitable for uh, producing uh, children. And so you mentioned her, and I just think that a lot of what she did was also rooted in advocacy work, also rooted in uh, bringing about, about awareness um, and strategies for prevention as well. So I don't know if that tackled that second part for you or not. Okay, okay. <laughs> Big fan of Fannie Lou Hamer. Thank you for bringing I, her up. Yeah, and I will add to that. I mean, there are two, two I mean, usually, well, talking about healthcare and all that, people look at doctors, right? I mean, that, that's, that's the common denominator, I will say. But there are other two pro group of professionals that are pivotal here. And there are the nurses and the social workers. Because they are the ones, they are the glue that keep the whole operation together. So when you were asking what the role, I would say if social workers is one of those pivots there in the, especially in basketball games, right? Everything happens so fast. Who is that you look for organizing the team and getting the things doing according to practice? It's the pivot, right? So that is a very important role. And I really appreciate the contribution that social workers make. Uh, same as the nurses. They're, they're we, we just don't have enough. I mean, I don't know how many gr we graduate in the state. I know it's not many. I don't know how many programs there are. The only one I know of is at Bell Haven. The medical, the social yeah, worker we don't, we don't have Are there enough. any others? Does Jackson any, yeah, State. Jackson State, oh, okay. Mississippi Jackson College. Yeah. So Mississippi we need State. like 10 times as many. We don't, yeah. we don't have, and still we're exporting workforce. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, yeah, that's, I think that's the important part that, that we... I mean, we, we could really use a social worker at the Jackson Free Clinic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, I don't know how we're going to get one because we can't pay or pay much, but gosh, we need one. <laughs> okay. uh, as for Fannie Lou Hamer, I would say go back in a time machine, bring her forward if you can, and let her loose. Because this kind of gets to the civil rights for health thing I was talking about. This is a grassroots community organization. You'll all have to cross talk and collaborate and put aside your differences because no single group can do this. Mm -hmm. This is to be everybody everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Donna Navarsky. I am one of the politicians, hopefully. I'm running, I'm a candidate for up in Oxford and Lafayette County for the state legislature. And this is a cornerstone of my platform, healthcare and especially inequities. And I want to speak to the ideology, the political part that we've all been dancing around. My job up in a fairly well to do area with people who have healthcare, but where there is 30% po under the poverty line, which is really surprising, um, to convince people that. Everybody needs it because it affects all outcomes. Our insurance rates are higher because our debt, medical debt, is higher. Our, um, not just insurance, but our um, credit rates are higher. Our millennials are leaving. Why should they stay when it's more expensive to buy a house and they might die in childbirth? The maternal death rate for black women exceeds three developing nations in the world. Mm -hmm. There are um, reasons to expand it, but my job is to convince people that everybody needs it. A healthy Mississippi is a thriving Mississippi, and it is ideology, and it is driven by politics. And how do you get beyond that and make people see it's in their best interest, because that's the only way I, as an aspiring politician, trying to get the point across that this is what we need, we don't have it. The majority has said we don't need it, but we do definitely need it. How do we do that? How do I do that? I point up statistics, I say, yeah, it's better for the state if everybody's healthy, more people work, more jobs, um, more people stay in school, et cetera. But there is a real political and ideological divide that has to be crossed. And so I'd like to hear suggestions, toss them out, 
you know, I need, I'd like to absorb knowledge you have that can help me explain to them, explain to my constituents, all citizens need health care. Donna Navarsky. Thanks. Well, I, I mean, I'll take a stab at this first. Okay. There's no holistic answer, but maybe yeah. we can chip away at it. Uh, there is a maternal Lejeune and Dr. A, I've seen your names on reports related to this, but there was a maternal mortality review report. Kate, I think you also wrote about it in Mississippi today. And that concluded 87% of maternal deaths are preventable. Mm -hmm. And overwhelmingly, mothers who die uh, don't have insurance or have poor access to healthcare services. We have this perception that Medicaid is for poor black women. And the truth is the majority of women or the majority of people on Medicaid are white, low income white Mississippians. I think that's an important point to make people aware of. And again, this gets to the point of an uneducated citizenry doesn't have the tools to advocate for their interests. I'm sure that a lot of people who are, a lot of white women who are on Medicaid are voting against their interests. And if we can somehow communicate the point that these social safety nets, these social programs that we have in place benefit everyone, and actually they disproportionately benefit white folks, potentially we could move the needle. I mean, a positive way to look at this is our needle is so far towards empty that any movement we can make is going to see progress. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, when I was saying that the problem is the ideology, is I'm saying is the problem also is with the, with the labels that things get for political campaign purposes. That's, that's where things get meddled. Because if we can bring that language to something that we can have a conversation without the labels, put, put the labels on the side and say, hey, but here is the issue. How many white women, in, like in your area, uh, are having these issues? And you compare with how many black women or Hispanic women are having this issue? And then you come, okay, the reasons for the deaths. Why are they happening? And then you will see it doesn't matter. Just like when we were in the pandemic. It, the virus don't care about your political affiliation, what passport you use, how many languages you speak, or any of that. If you're vulnerable, the virus will hit you, and if it can kill you, it will kill you. That's it. That's it. It doesn't matter. So here, my suggestion will be try to identify a way to put this without the labels. And so the people will feel that, okay, we're not going to rotulate, make a rotulation of stuff. So simply we're having a conversation about things that are logical here that are happening. And, and, and in that way, I think it can diffuse a lot of that um, um, political campaign vibe or energy that happens. Because yes, for political campaigns, it, it pays off to make these labels. Uh, but for the real purpose of making a transformation in the society, it doesn't help much. To me, that's, sorry, Michael, just a quick comment. That's, that's the hardest question of the evening, what you just asked. Mm -hmm. uh, this is still a very individualistic country. Mm -hmm. And I see that if you guys don't see it, but I know you do. But I come from Europe, from Britain, and... Uh, it, there's a, a much deeper sense of uh, collectivity, if that's mm. a word. <laughs> the whole society as one society. And I see that much less here, particularly in the South. It's not a question of just saying, oh, I care about that person or stuff. People are great here if it's a volunteer weekend or mm. collect money, a drive for this or that. But then it's done and dusted and you're away. It's back to business as usual. Mm. And... Uh, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. said something like this, I'll have to paraphrase, you know, you pass somebody begging on the street and you toss them a $5 bill and you do it again the next day and the next day. 
But surely at some point you want to stop and say, well, why is he on the street begging? <laughs> and shouldn't we tackle that problem? To me, this country is not very good at asking that big question. So, I, so there's no answer there. I don't know. I agree. It's a very complex question to explore and, and digest. You know, I used to say Mississippi votes um, against its best interest, but it's really not Mississippi. Because typically when we look at the numbers, black people vote in their best interest. White people typically do not vote in their best interest. And the fact of the matter is, I don't even know, let me see, is it an educational issue or is it uh, a matter of race, white privilege? You know, my whiteness is a, is a privilege, it's a, it's a power resource. And if I can prevent a minority group from having access to better resources, better services, then that's advantageous for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to vote against my best interest because in the long run, it's most advantageous to me. So I even struggle with thinking that it's an educational issue, um, but rather a, a matter of privilege, white privilege. I agree. Hi, yeah, um, I just wanted to um, say that I agree so much with, with what Donna was saying. And although we have people in our state, many of whom are Republicans, many of whom are Democrats, um, I, I couldn't agree more with the idea that, you know, I, 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 mean, I mean, yes, that expanding Medicare would, would add about two, 300,000 people to that program, yes, there are many people that will benefit by having more services, but I feel like I and everybody will absolutely benefit, even if they have health care, by having stronger hospitals, more programs, um, more, you know, um, those hospitals will have more resources, our communities will have more jobs. So my, my, um, thought is if, if how do you know how do we talk to people in ways where we can say well is there any i mean I, I see no i see no advantage whatsoever to rejecting um, expanding medicaid unless it's some kind of um, political branding i don't i otherwise don't see there, you know, so, the, so, the, so the challenge would be, well, what do you see as an advantage? <laughs> I guess I, I liked really what Ms. Johnson was saying. That's a really interesting point of view, but ultimately that's not an advantage, right? I agree. So it's, it's, a a di it's a disadvantage. A uh, it's a perceived advantage. Like, I agree. It, it's, it's very much smoke and mirror is a delusion, but it's a perception that, I, that, that this is advantageous for me and my family. That too, I agree with that, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, oh, there it is, okay. <laughs> Um, so, uh, one of my questions that I'm just going to, I guess, end with is um, we mentioned, or every, everyone on the panel has mentioned um, expanding Medicaid to America in comparison to Medicaid or the equivalent in other countries. Um, so, I'm kind of wondering if uh, there could be, well, first of all, kind of a distinction between like Medicaid and free health care, as well as um, when speaking with a lot of these people from other countries who have um, free health care, such as you mentioned Canada or from other Scandinavian countries uh, and Europe and so on, um, a lot of times they show disdain or just discomfort with the type of medical system they have. Um, now, using the word of the day, paradox, it seems like everyone in every country hates their medical system. So the question here is, do the pros outweigh the cons in any of the two systems? Um, and if we should 
um, kind of go with Medicaid versus what we have here? Uh, I would say that from the surveys I know of, most people in their countries don't hate their medical care system. Some people do. You can't please everyone, and there's no perfect system for sure. Britain has problems, Canada has problems, and so on. But most of the surveys in those other countries, most, the majority of people are satisfied with mm -hmm. health care. It depends on your expectations, Correct. okay? But uh, what they all have, uh, I probably, it wasn't fair to say free health care, they have universal coverage. So they make sure everyone's covered. Even in Britain, it's not free. Mm -hmm. We have higher tax rates, and when you live there, you're just taxed more at source, out of your paycheck. It, the difference is uh, there's no insurance system, mm -hmm. there's no paperwork, you don't get billed, you don't have co-pays, you don't have deductibles, on and on and on. I mean, it's, it's just, to me, the system here is a nightmare. It's just horrible. Yeah. So it's not technically free. So there's, but anyway, in these other countries with universal health care, there is no Medicaid because everyone's covered, <laughs> right? So uh, that kind of answers that. As for other models, well, there are probably a dozen or more, okay? So, but we are the outlier. We mm -hmm. just have a profit, basically a profit-based system. Uh, whether it's Aetna, United, you name it, you have now... The Profit industry, private industry, creeping into Medicare with Medicare Advantage. Yeah. They're trying to eat into this. Mm -hmm. So we've never, ever gotten away from a profit. Yeah, and it's rooted in the Constitution. I mean, I was just giving the example. The United States, health is not a right for the people. It might be a right, the Second Amendment and all those. There are other rights, but health is not one of them. That's a substantial difference with many other countries. And there, there's no perfect system. None of the systems in the world is perfect. None of them. There's one thing happening in one country, there's another thing happening in another country. Like in Colombia, for instance, right now we're talking about reform of our national health system. But 75% of the people are happy with the system. Still, there's 25% of the people that have complaints. And yes, there are things to fix. So the idea is to build where the good things are and improve them, right? And fix the ones that are not fixable that simple. So, but in the States, here the Constitution is completely different. So then we have to look for a way that will work within our constitutional framework and also given the uh, high degree of autonomy that states have. Like in our constitution, the states are in charge of health. That's why this is a state decision. It's not a federal decision. Federal will put the means, like giving you the $90, right? Or the $9 on the 10, whatever way you prefer. But it's up to the state to decide whether the state will take the $9 or not. So far, we have 10 states that are not taking the $9. Five of them are in our neighborhood, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, and South Carolina, right? So that's our deep south neighborhood, right? Even though Louisiana and other states in the vicinity, they are as red as we are, and they have taken mm -hmm. the expansion. So uh, to me, sometimes it's kind of, okay, what's so special about Mississippi that even other states as red as Mississippi take some things and we don't. I mean, that to me, I'm only being here four and a half years, so I still not all enough in Mississippi topics to understand that, but that's appealing to me. Why is that difference, right? Well, maybe then you're saying we need a constitutional amendment. It has to be ratified by a majority. Of the uh, that states, will be an avenue for Which is instance. what they did for slavery. Okay. That will be an avenue. Maybe we should do that. But if I'm not mistaken, I think they did a recent poll in, in, of Mississippians, and most Mississippians were in favor of Medicaid expansion. So mm -hmm. people aren't, you know, what's going on? <laughs> yes, but that doesn't translate into the reality. Well, that right? just speaks to how unresponsive legislatures are mm. to, the, to the will and desire of the people. 
And I think the responses of the polls depend heavily on the wording you use to describe because people associate Medicaid expansion, obviously, with certain things. And it's a label. Yeah. It's a label, so. Thank you all so much. And let's give our panel a big hand. Let me see, yes. I was just, because there's not many opportunities for us to find the sim commonalities between us. So I just wanted to say happy Ramadan, happy Passover, and happy Easter. It's not common, it happens. <laughs> That's Thank right. you for that, Lamise. Thank you. And if, um, if you all would like to continue the conversation, we do have a reception uh, just uh, to, the, to my right here. Um, so please stay around and um, enjoy some refreshments and continue the conversation. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you.